Next, we have Scott Haas, Department of Emergency Services Director, for his quarterly update. Welcome, Mr. Medical Director. Mm -hmm. Good evening. <laughs> We've been slowly trying to reel Doc back into the emergency services world, and so we're going to ask him to sit with us tonight because the providers that are starting to see you start responding out in the field again. So, good evening again, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for allowing us to do uh, an update. Normally, we like to switch and do different divisions each time that we come in. And if you recall, I had these two gentlemen with me the last time. And because of so much action happening in their areas, I felt it, uh, that we should give an update again on emergency medical services and our communications division. So Scott's got some good news and some bad news to give you. Jim's got some bad news and some good news to give you. Uh, our, our biggest good news that we have right now is we have moved back into our building and uh, the 911 center is 100% operational, which Jim is going to cover. Uh, we have moved out of the courthouse and we're back, back into our facility. There's still a lot of things that need done at the facility because we've uh, experienced back orders and not uh, receiving all the supplies that we need uh, immediately. So probably sometime after the first of the year, we'll be 100% at the building, uh, but we're, we're happy to be home. And I'm sure both of these gentlemen are going to highlight that. But Scott, I'll turn it over to you. You can go ahead and kick it off on the emergency medical services. Well, first of all, I want to thank the five of you for approving my action items, because if not, that would have really messed my presentation up. <laughs> so I want to say you already had it. in your I really did. I was really hoping it was a yes. <laughs> we, we had an emergency delete <laughs> button for the horse to strike through that one. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to give you uh, my parents always taught me bring the good home, so that's going to be the last. I'm going to let you know the realistic things that are happening. And I know that many of you are in tune because you text me and let me know that you're listening, and I appreciate that more than you'll ever know. Um, our call volume is up. It's, it's, it's no, I'm not sugarcoating it. Uh, from the previous update I gave you, we're up 350 or 329 calls, and we're up 157 transports from the last time I was in front of you. So it, it's no sugarcoating there. What? From the previous update no, no, I gave what? you. What, what do you attribute to this? Well, our motor vehicle collisions are off the hook right now, and I don't know what the cause is. Our serious medical calls are off the hook. And when I say that, I think it's because it's a combination of the health care system in general. People cannot get in to see their primary health care physicians. They're waiting longer. They're trying to treat themselves at home. And we're doing a heck of a job with our MIC group that Doc alluded to, but I think that just sick patients is a more realistic thing. There's a lot of respiratory viruses out there right now that we're hearing it in the young people, but there's an adult population that's suffering from this respiratory illness that's pretty sincere other than COVID, and that's causing some of our attrition with our, our <coughs> calls with uh, high respiratory problems. Um, so our call volume's up, our transports are up, we're transporting the hospitals, then we're running into our challenges at the hospital which you all are well aware of, instead of going over there and transferring a patient off in 15 or 20 minutes, we may be waiting in the hallway for an hour, hour and a half, two hours to get a patient off our stretcher and continuing care there till we get back. So um, we're meeting the challenges. We have not missed any calls yet. You, you see weekly when I let you know what our depletion uh, of our units are, and I, I don't do that to try to bug you about it. I just want you to be in the, the know about it. Uh, when it's happening. So the high acuities or calls are up. Uh, our rapid sequence intubation, which I know that's uh, something that you all, the, the ones that were here when we first started that program back in 2007, uh, that is a skill that we are privileged to do. Not all the systems can do that throughout the state of Maryland, but that's a high acuity skill. We've done three in the last two weeks where normally we do three to four a quarter. So these are calls that require advanced airway where we actually paralyze the patient except for their heartbeat and we control their airway by inserting a breathing tube and putting them on our ventilator and controlling the respirations. Uh, with that, our, our COVID calls have remained about the same, but it's always a concern with our clinicians. Anytime they're doing respiratory procedures or they have a patient that presents with respiratory illness, we have to consider it being 
COVID until otherwise. So we're donning our equipment. We're putting the N95s on. We're putting our gowns or our jumpsuits on. And as you know, that is very hot. And uh, it takes a lot out of our, our, our clinicians. And I just want you to realize the stress that they're under and they are achieving and maintaining excellence and professionalism. And I cannot tell you how proud I am of them for their daily work. Uh, our staffing continues to be challenges. We've had more resignations, which all of you are, are in tune to. And our turnover is up, which also means that the newer people we're getting in, we have less than about 15% of our staff that are experienced clinicians that have been here for over 10 years. The majority of our staff is less than five years of experience and even a greater is less than two years experience. So the older days of the experienced paramedics, being able to really be quick on calls and understand that, that is a challenge that we are now facing that we've heard other departments have faced for years. It has now hit us truly that the older and more seasoned clinicians upon us have moved on, have medical retirements, have left to go other places, and we have now a young group of individuals. And that is causing some challenges. For the first time, I've had to have holdovers, mandatory holdovers to keep units in service. We, were, we mandated our holdovers one day and we actually had to shut two transport units down at different times throughout different days because we didn't have the staffing to meet the minimum staffing. And that's very hard to say that a section had a transport unit shut down. Um, but we're doing our best to get the staff and we had interviews today. We're trying to recruit good paramedics. We don't just want a paramedic card. We want clinicians that I know could go to either one of your five residents and take care of you superiorly and professionally to assure that you get the best EMS there is. I don't just want a card carrier. I want somebody that knows what they're doing. That's what you asked me to do in this position and I'm going to continue to do it. And Scott, there's one thing I'd like to highlight there, uh, the challenges that we're facing. So today, Scott highlighted that we did interviews. So we have three positions that are currently open within our, our division. And normally, we see anywhere from 40 to 50 applicants per position. We had three applicants for the three really? positions that we have open wow. is the difference of what we're seeing right now. So it's, it's been a huge challenge for us. Remember, over the last two years, there's no, their paramedic schools have been shut down. The EMT schools have been shut down. COVID is affecting and now this continued snowball effect, there's going to be catch up. We've got to sell our system to be the gold that people want to come to work for. So I'm going to keep bugging you about that. And it's going to be at least two and a half to three years for the programs to catch up at on, least. on how much shortage there is in the field right now. It's That's when a lot of people retired then. Otherwise, they're sitting at home collecting that unemployment because they don't want to work. But. You're not going to beat me, sir. Yes. <laughs> I, I strongly agree. Now, with and, you, and you guys, uh, with the, this, the same theory, why the, the nurses are a shortage as well, the, the nursing schools were closed down. Nursing that's were that's closed. part of the problem. Okay. That they, they've had, they've experienced the same. And I know, at least at Chesapeake College, the programs are overwhelmed right now. The people entering into the programs because they haven't had that influx over the last two years. And a stress, it's not just us. This is systems everywhere. Uh, I'm on a group that I get emails every day uh, from other EMS chiefs all through the nation, and they're all sitting here doing the same thing I'm doing, and we're scratching our heads because, like, even when I applied back in 2004 here, it was very competitive to get hired here. I was very blessed I got the position, and it's not like that anymore. So that's the bad. Now I want to give you a little bit of good news. Thank you for approving our soup unit and our ZOL monitors. The video is out today. If you want to learn more about our ZOL monitors, we are the first in the state to get this technology. And our two ZOL monitors that you approved tonight, and we had three that were retrofitted. We're going to be replacing our monitors every year after this, trying to get all of our monitors up to standard. So I can't thank you enough for that. We're going to continue the AED program, teaching that CPR and AED and getting them out in all the vehicles, as the director alluded to earlier. And I appreciate your support, and uh, I'm really proud of that. With that, I want to challenge all five, five of you at some point, and I've been uh, poking Commissioner Duminell a little bit. I would love for you to come spend five or six hours with me. I'll put the chief's unit in service, and we'll run calls. And I don't care when, Monday through Friday, boring times. No, let's go on a weekend. Let's go on a night. I will come here, and we'll run calls. I want you to see this firsthand. Um, with that in mind. I might even drag Doc out with us, too. That would be a treat for you. 
Um, if you're going to be at MAKO in, the, in December, I have been asked to speak at that. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our MIG program, but the biggest thing I'm talking about is our backline, our Doctor First for EMS that I brought to you a couple months ago. Uh, we are, the, as I said, the first in the state, and a lot of people are asking questions about that technology, and I'm very proud that I've been asked to uh, present at MAKO about that. Also, our department, our division has been asked to write a white paper on Doctor First and how it's integrating our mobile and created community health. And Doc has seen that, and the boss have seen that, and if any of you know the history of Southwest Airlines, how a little idea was scribbled on a napkin, that's how Doc and Scott actually uh, first thought of the MIC program, and that's going to be a published paper, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you when it comes out. We're going to continue working on our active assailant education with our special ops division, making sure our, our clinicians get everything they knew and everything they need to do to prepare for that in case the worst day happens here in Queen Anne's County. I say this all the time, we're going to train like lives depend on it, because believe it or not, folks, it does. We have to train. So you've seen all the PSAs I've been putting out, all the public releases about training and our high acuity training. We're going to keep doing that. We got our nice mannequins that we've been working with with the health department, and eventually I'm going to give you a good demo uh, and so you can see why that was such a, a great thing that we uh, accomplished. And I told you last time I was here, I'd hope that I would come back, and now I can honestly tell you we did get the Mission Lifeline Gold status for year number five in a row, and I'm extremely proud of that and our folks for all that it takes to get that. We have a little thing coming up in a couple weeks called the Bay Bridge Run, and uh, we're knee-deep in that planning and logistics uh, with the other divisions from our department. Uh, we're looking forward to supporting that, and we're going to finish that and turn the page, and then you guys are going to let us know it's time to start planning our fiscal year budget for 23. So we're going to take a couple of rests for a week, and then we're getting back into budget planning. And I'm going to continue with the leadership of Scott and all the fantastic clinicians in DES and the volunteer services. I need to give a true kudos for the volunteers because they have come out. We've had several mass casualty incidents in the last month. The volunteers have been able to help with transports with that and have stepped ambulances up at very unique times during the day and night. I'm very thankful for the continued um, symbiotic relationship we have with our volunteer fire services. So budget planning, do you want to hit a little bit on I do. I do indeed. So I, I would be um, dismissed if I didn't tell you this, but I want you to honestly put in your minds that I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask to open another station and staff paramedic 200 24 seven in the next budget season to give us another transport unit to hopefully get full time clinicians that we have on staff that we can meet our call volume as we're getting it today and that when we start depleting our units we have another unit in service several things are happening with this. We are transferring more patients out of the Queen Anne Emergency Room. I don't know if you see the interfacility transports from Queen Anne Emergency Room text messages, but these are patients that have to go to higher tertiary care centers on the Western Shore or to Easton. The private ambulance is unable to make the needs, and so we're pulling a unit for that. And then we end up going to the hospital and waiting for a bed, et cetera, et cetera. Even though there's a bed arranged, doesn't mean that we just roll in there and transfer the patient off the bed. And as you saw, the call volume is, is up more than ever before. Um, there is a national standard called unit utilization hours, and normal unit utilization hours runs between 0.3 and 0.5, looking at over a 24-hour shift, which means that 30 to 50% of your time you should be busy running calls and transferring, et cetera, et cetera. We do not have a way to really monitor our transfer hours, but we've had three units hit over 0.6 unit utilization hours in the last several months, which is extremely high for a, a system of our size. So I want to put it on your radar. I don't want to blindside you with it, but I want to at least bring it to your knowledge. So, it, so in asking to put 200, that, that's the uh, the uh, center block pillbox at the, the Narrows Marina. Correct. Okay. So I know there's there would, would there be will there be some build outs that need to take place to accommodate uh, yes. a crew there? Yes. There, we have to work with DPW and obviously talk about that, but if you gave me the rights to do it, I could put a crew there right now to manage until we did that. So I know there's Who's a couple, there right bunk, now? Just there's a couple bunks in there, right? Unless everybody's fully staffed and everybody comes to work, then I have a paramedic 200. You hear that once in a while. Right. And right after the fiscal year, we had that. We were doing really well, and then the resignations happened. So I, I had it for a short period of time. And from a budget standpoint, it's going to take you three years to find paramedics. We've got plenty of time to... <laughs> There's oh, my oh, favorite oh, commissioners oh, with wow. jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I think he just kicked you. We'll see. I appreciate, 
I appreciate your time, and I've always been upfront and honest with you, and I appreciate what you do for us. Thank you. We will find the paramedics. There you go. Worry. Uh, I figured you would. So, part two of this. Well uh, done, Jim. I'm going to continue Scott's challenge. So, uh, part two is is uh, Jim's update on the 911 center. And if you haven't seen it yet, you need to come out and see the, the new technology we have at the 911 center. It's I think we've got one of the best centers on the Eastern Shore, if not the best center on the Eastern Shore. Uh, the room is totally redesigned. It's it, everything inside of it is brand new, and it's a, a great home for our 911 um, dispatchers and supervisors. And the pictures that he's going to show you of what the center looks like up here does not do it justice to what it actually looks like live. Uh, we're actually giving a formal tour tomorrow at 10 o'clock around 10 ish. And we're welcome to join us if you like. The Drug Fee Coalition is going to come through and take a look at it after their, their meeting. If uh, any group would like to visit our 911 center, we're a phone call away. And we're, we're happy to show uh, the technology that you guys have invested in over the last couple of years. So, Jim, not to put any pressure on you, but take it away. So the first thing I have to do is, uh, is thank the commissioners for uh, doing the uh, critical force study and giving us, uh, giving the whole division a raise. We lost our edge. And uh, for the years I've been here, I could always maintain a full center uh, with COVID and everybody else giving pay increases. We were, we were bleeding pretty bad. Um, we're getting that edge back. I still have a few openings, but every dispatcher we sat down, each, each one of them, the director and I, and uh, gave them their, the great news. They were very appreciative. It's done a lot for the morale, and it's uh, it's starting to stop that bleeding. So, on behalf of the whole division, we thank you very much for that. It uh, it's put us back in the game. There we go. Whoops. Sorry. So, next generation 911. So, we have finally finished the vast procurement phase. Uh, we went to the numbers board last month, asked for another seven hundred thousand dollars for the shore. This takes the AT and T, which is coming to the door. And everybody has Carousel Motorola equipment, so this ties the two together and makes it work. Um, that was approved. <clears throat> Queen Anne's County was the uh, fiduciary on that, so we're, we're moving forward. Uh, Queen Anne's County, um, we signed the contract back in December, right before Christmas. Our special construction is already installed. We have a Verizon circuits in place now, and we have Maryland Broadband, which is running fiber up 301, um, coming to the MSP barracks, and they're also coming in from 304 up um, safety drive so they'll be coming into each side of the building so we'll have true diversity and they should be done here in about a couple of weeks <clears throat> we have a projected go live date uh, of january 22nd um motorola oh, excuse me at&t is all ready to go the problem is motorola bought out vesta so they could get better corner on the market so their resources are very limited so uh, i can tell you montgomery county was the first maryland county that signed um, under the uh, DC project, they just went live last week, so they're two and a half years waiting for this to happen. Um, they're picking up a little bit of speed, but uh, at and is very optimistic for January 22nd, Jan January 2022. Uh, Motorola is slowing down, but uh, first quarter we're supposed to go uh, with our next generation 911, and the rest, of, the rest of the shore should fall in behind us. And Jim has to come in here January and say it's <coughs> operational. I, I push Since we hard. gave you a bunch of challenges, that's Jim's challenge. I, I'm pushed very hard. Uh, so the 911 Center, I'm going to go just a little bit further. I am going to say that we have probably for another, another couple of weeks until the next 911 Center does a refresh, the most current 911 Center in the state of Maryland. Uh, when we got at the room, we pulled everything out. We have fiber optics. We have all brand new cables. Uh, we, right now, we are the state-of-the-art center in the state. Can't, I won't hold on that title very long because there's somebody right behind me, but uh, it's going to come along and update. But we basically had a six positions. Um, if Caroline or George or Talbot or even Kent needed to come over uh, an emergency, we didn't have room for them. Um, we truly didn't have a backup center. So we have 10 workstations in the new center. Um, six of them have primary radios, which we brought over. Two of them we have a laptop set up. It's not the best idea, but we do have that in case we have an emergency. And I have two seats that can only answer 911 system. We have a brand new phone system that is what they call in soak mode. It's there, it's running. They're looking for any problems. It goes live on November, excuse me, on November 9th. Um, and then we are taking out all the copper and we're putting in PR, PR lines are in and that new phone system will switch over to the PRIs. I have a few open positions. It's been kind of hard, but we are working on um, getting that uh, filled. The problem is uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to get people interested. Um, 
we've had some entry level come in. We go through them, they're not interested, or they once they get in there and find out what it's all about, they don't want to do it. So we've tried to go after more seasoned. With the raise, we're, we're starting to get a little bit of interest back in that. So we'll, we'll see how we make out with that over the next couple of weeks. Computer-aided dispatch. So this is the next big one that's, uh, other than um, next gen one, this is the other big thing that's on the plate. Um, we have our teams building it. The sheriff's office has their teams. We have the CAD team that is in building. Um, some of the big things is the active done one interface for the fire service. We've been working with them to make sure that they're getting all the information that they need. So this is their chance to go back and work with the CAD people and say, this is the data that we're looking for. This is the order we want it in. And we make sure we get that to them. The other big one is image trend. That's for EMS. Um, doctor, you know, it's uh, at, at hospital. At hospital. So this is able to tie into the CAD system so we can track how long and the ambulances are at the hospital, what their turnaround time is. It gives us a lot more data. Right now, we can't do that with our current CAD, but we will with a new one. And the one that I'm really happy about is it's called ASAP to PSAP. We get so many alarm calls a day, we have to pick up the phone and enter the information. This is a national standard. They automatically drop it into our CAD system. We don't have to have any more phone calls. We get more information, and all the information is right there. We will be the second. Prince George's County has it right now. We will be the second to have ASAP to PSAP. It's a very well-known platform and it's gaining um, popularity and speed. And if you notice when there, I put the little date for you a couple times. April 5th is when we go live. So we can get rid of a, a very old CAD system and we'll go live on uh, April 5th. It just gives you the, kind of a guideline. April 8th is our last build out with our CAD team. Um, December, November, excuse me, December 7th is the last with the RMS, the Shanshaw Records Management System for the Sheriff's Office. December 22nd, all of our systems have to be, and data is in, the systems are locked, they start cleaning it up, and then start doing an audit. January 22nd is when we start uh, mobility administrative training for field reporting, that's more for the law. And then uh, January 4th through 6th is when we go into CAD functionality with, the, with CAD. February is all CAD interfaces will be installed and tested. March is when we start training whole month March and then April 4th we have the team fly in and on April 5th we throw the switch. What's biggest about this and it's for our for an EMS and the fire and EMS is it's called crew force. It's going to give them a much better platform of being able to use the mapping. Um, they'll have information right there on their iOS or their phones. They can't do that right now. They have active 911 but they get this little kind of like a page text message. This is very interactive. They can go they can see where the call is. As we are putting notes into the call with the information, it's going right to their, their devising and, and updating. Um, it's all real time. It's updated real time. There's no lag. So that will be part of the, uh, the go live. And this was supposed to be the basement of the courthouse. I had a lot of pictures in there, but for some, for some reason they didn't stick. Um, Scott kind of misled you when he said we would be done at the courthouse. I got a little corner and I'm not giving it back to you. But the backup center has the brand new carpet in. We have five 911 consoles, thanks to the numbers board. Um, we went to the numbers board last month and I was able to get some more grants for a UPS and for a fire suppression system, which should be going in soon. And our goal is by November 9th, when we do the new phone system, we'll be able to at least process 911 calls there and some limited radio capabilities. And then once we have the new CAD up and running, we'll be pretty much a functional backup center. And the shell of the room is there now, so if you happen to be in the courthouse, take a trip in the basement and take a look at it. But it, it will be a very impressive setup also when it's finished. <coughs> Do we have any questions? Questions? Mm. That was very thorough. The thing I want to end on is um, both these guys. My, my budget. I need $300,000 to finish out the comm center for radios. So there you go. Finish it for what? <laughs> radios. Oh, okay. Four radios to, to, for the console. So what I, what I want to end on is uh, both these guys run our 24-7 operations. And the staff that is working on our 24-7 operations, they basi basically, uh, I've told you our shortage that we have in staff right now, the staff has really stepped up and has worked really hard to make sure that there are no holes anywhere in the system. And I know on the dispatch side, I keep going into the room and same it's like, I, it's the same faces, same people working over and over and over again. And they are really committed 
to make sure our system does not fail. And I'm very proud of both divisions and how both divisions have stood up and, and handled this. As our farmers would say, they spend more time here with us than they have at home, but it's always the same faces, but they're in there making sure that we have the staff to, to, to keep the place running. But I leave Excellent. in the evening, and it's the same faces I see the next morning. And, it, and it's been that over and over again in both divisions. And they are very dedicated employees and are working very hard to make sure our system stays up and running. And we're very proud of them. Awesome. Everything? No, I'm good. Okay. We know you're good. <laughs> I'd be glad to be out there running in the field. <laughs> and we'll be glad to see you out there. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for what you're